What's up, folks? We are back. Another week in MLW. Another video out. Another pod to discuss what happened between the Wildcats and the Cobras. Another great series. I had a great time commentating, at least. Jack, did I sound money? A1. A1? A1. Good, good. Kyle's a good editor, I guess, because I did screw up a couple times. But overall, great series. We're going to have Kyle Schultz on tonight as our guest in the studio with us. We're going to break down the whole thing. Game one, game two, game three. Chopping it up. Chopping it up about the jerseys and the hype about the Cobras jerseys, as well as even some extracurriculars, as we always give you on this podcast. So another good one. And this is the Pipe It Up podcast. Cue the intro. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Pipe It Up podcast, the official podcast of MLW Wiffle Ball. And I'm here with a couple of good buddies of mine, Jack Agner, Kyle Schultz. We got the old crew back in the building, the Sparky crew. First episode right. back. Yes, right, sir. Man. But uh, got some whiffs to talk today. Feels right. Feels Good to right. be back in the still. A little Saturday night app, a little Saturday night <laughs> recording. <laughs> Let's do it. That's how we spend our Saturday nights, boys. We got, check my wristwatch here. I think it's 9.05 p.m. on a Saturday. Sounds Jack just right. wrapped up a series against the Gators, but we'll talk about that next week, of course. But today we wanted to address Mr. Schultz's series here, Cobra's Cats. Yep. That was a banger. Great video, great series, in my opinion. I appreciate it, yeah. Like I said in the uh, post-game interview, just a very big team win for us. I thought everybody contributed, and that's what I was most proud of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wildcats took game one and game three to get the series two to one. Overall, I think a lot of players played well, but I think a couple surprises for me was Baron. You got the Baron on the first at-bat. That shocked me. That's true, yeah. Gate. Yeah, no, we did we did some film work, I won't lie, and I've been seeing Baron. Um I remember at the end of the series last year, I was like, I I I know I wish I had another game because we really struggled, but at the game three, um, we felt we were coming around. But yeah, just after some film work and talking in the group chat with the guys, we felt like we had uh were pretty prepared coming into the series and it showed and um it's just a testament to our, I guess, preparation. That first at bat caught me off guard because once again, getting back into the groove of things, hadn't commentated in a while, and it didn't sound a lot off the bat. I was like, oh, that one's popped up into right field. And I look up, I'm like, that's for sure going to be gone. Yeah. I know. <laughs> like, I had to recover my calls. I know. I, I, I wasn't too sure if that was going to be fair or not, but... It was I mean, fair by pretty Yeah, no, you it felt pretty certain. It a lot, but yeah, it... it, it, it uh, I made sure to, uh, to go the extra mile when editing that, too. So I <laughs> added, like, a virtual foul pole there that was, like, super high up. So it could kind of show, like, the ball traveling around it. So We need, like, a, we need, like, a GoPro on the fence on the foul pole shooting straight north. Yeah. Straight exactly. up into the sky. There was Absolutely. one. Just a, there was just a beam. There was one comment I saw about um, pe- people just thinking about conspiracy theories it, uh, about that hit, whether it was right. fair or foul. But right. I, I knew it. Theories. I knew as soon as I like I saw it, I was like, "Oh, people are gonna. Some people are gonna be upset." It was truly. About a, that. It was a pesky pull moment. It was a pesky yeah. pull moment. But it was. It was fair by a pretty good margin. Oh yeah, it was. I think it was fair for sure. I think this could apply Without to foul pull there, technology but. too. But I'm surprised in the NFL. I've been saying this for probably ten years now. You know how they review like touchdowns on the goal line when it's like a, a QB sneak or whatever, and a guy's like right yeah. at the goal line. Got to have some better technology. Why can't we like <laughs> have a like almost like a holog like a hologram like, yeah. project a, like a laser kind of yeah? So project. Imagine if like the goal line and beyond into the end zone was like a different hue on screen, like a, a blue hue, mm-hmm. and whatever cross that like changed the color. Mm-hmm. Like in three D, you could map that out with the budget of the NFL. That could be done. I feel like. I f- you're right. With the budget of the NFL, they've got to be able to come up with something better than slowing it down for a replay for 45 minutes every but the time. The camera angles have having, gotten better over the years, but they have gotten better. All you got to do is put a chip in the ball. Well, that also. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. I and think that's less fun. <laughs> yeah. And then have that would it, be great. You have it like magnetized, like the goal line or something like that. But the yeah. chip would have to. The chip would have to recognize like. The entire part of the ball. Yeah, the entire it couldn't, ball. It couldn't, it'd have to be on the very end of it. I don't, I don't yeah. know if we're there yet at a technical. I don't know. Technology. Who knows? If they hire Elon Musk, maybe to get into the replays for the NFL. Maybe that chat, might work chat out. GPT could figure it chat out. Chat GPT. That probably if we put it into Chat GPT, Chat GPT, like <laughs> it's kind of tough how to, to better do NFL replays. I feel like that'd be a good solution. They'd there. probably figure it out. They, as if they, it's a person. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but anyways, yeah, tough call. But once again, in real time, I saw it fair. I don't think it was that close, to be honest. But yeah. There wasn't too many. I feel like I've known as the guy for making the tough calls in the league from that one World Series where it was a lot of controversy. I feel like there wasn't too much of that in this series for the most part. There were a couple reviews. There was one review where I think I called the runner out and then we reversed it to safe. Mm. I remember that one. Like before I even looked at the camera, I'm like, I feel like I might have I might have botched that. But I called it on the field as an out. So I had to stick with that unless I saw the evidence. And I think it was pretty clear. Yeah, was that, that an appeal? Really was that an appeal? Because I, I think I remember hearing in the video people. That review kind of came from upstairs, to be honest. Okay. I, I wanted to take a look at that. That okay. came from upstairs. Came yeah, you guys ended up getting that right. 
Yeah, you guys we, got it right. We, we got it right. Me and yeah. me and Dan, <laughs> me and Dan took a look at it. I think we got it right. That was a long review too. People we didn't won't have an see iPhone. We yeah, didn't people, have an iPhone. People won't see it home, but that was probably like a five minute review. Like that was up there with like Fox Sports. Like mm-hmm. little little long there. For those you of didn't you, have an iPhone. Like you were using a camera. And yeah. Set so first. for those of you at home who are, have your own leagues and whatnot, yes, the expensive cameras are nice. But in terms of quickly reviewing footage at a frame by frame basis and having a good look at it and easily accessible, iPhones are great. That's yeah. part of the reason why we have an iPhone stationed by first base and not an expensive camera because reviews are so efficient. Really just pull up the clip and you can go with your thumb and just swipe left and right and perfectly look at it frame by frame. And it's pretty darn easy to tell right away. We've talked about this on the podcast before, how mm-hmm. how effe- how many things you can professionally film with an iPhone. Now look at this basement right now, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> we got I'm looking at iPhone, it. iPhone, <laughs> iPhone, yeah. and iPhone, four yep. phones. So yeah, you can do a lot with iPhones for sure. But I think... So far this year in MLW, I think we've got all the calls right. I think we've I think we've done a good job. I think job. so. I think we've also taken strides with uh, check swings. I thought that was a problem last year, which is everybody chipping in on what was a check swing and who went around and all that kind of stuff. But up to this point, I feel like we've gotten every single one of these right. So not to you know, knock the, on wood. Hopefully, hopefully we keep that going. But I think the check swings come into play more around playoff yeah, time, like because everyone yeah. is just that much more focused you know what i mean and every single play matters that much more so people get more heated obviously when it doesn't go their way yeah but you yeah. need you need one voice out there and i like when yeah. it's coming from behind the camera that's the problem the right ump. there is because yeah so there's usually like three or four guys standing on the first baseline and everyone's moving their arms and then the hitter sees that and it plays a role in it and it should be like kyle said the guy behind the camera there, there's also the like it's such a weird rule even in baseball too like it's not always when like the barrel of the bat like crosses like the plate or whatever like that and and then some people go by like did he try to uh, attempt to hit the ball mm-hmm. like there's like a very like there's some confusion there so what is the what is the it's, general... it's attempting to hit the ball like a striking at the ball an attempt to strike at the ball that's like what determines a swing so it's like really? a, it, it truly is like an umpire's discretion call so it's not a it's not a a plane that's, that needs to be crossed that's how most that is people correct. judge it i think but yeah that's a lot how, of the time a lot of times when you do go like over 50 percent of the way then that's what people deem a strike at the ball and then mm. you, obviously you go past that mark and come back like that is kind of striking out the ball so like mm. i feel like every that's ump really interesting. may have their own way of of calling it but i think that's like the textbook definition my, i did my, not know striking that. at the ball my general rule is like if their hands break so they're coming through at the ball and like they keep the barrel back no swing but if the hands yeah. break and the in the bat the barrel comes through a little bit yep. that's especially in wiffle ball when the barrel moves such a, at such a fast rate yeah that's pretty much a swing in that makes sense. yeah and the reason they don't do it where it's like did the barrel pass like the front edge of home plate is because like some guys just like move up in the box and some guys move back so you could have an advantage based on where you stand in the in the, in the turf that makes sense yeah yeah i kind of wanted to uh you mentioned some film work and chats that you were having with your team going against baron oh yeah are you are you keeping your cards close to your oh, chest sure. or can we can we discuss like well, a little I mean, bit it's of not anything? even it's not even like too too, too secretive it's yeah. just like figuring out what he's throwing when he does a certain certain type of delivery like a lot of guys are good with with shielding the ball now and like mm. you can't really tell what they're like directly what their grip is but the split second before they release the ball based on where their shoulders are or the way their head moves or the way their legs open up you can kind of learn and, and gain insights on each pitcher so um, just going that extra mile and kind of like rewatching film from every pitcher is something I recommend to that's, not only my squad but everybody. That's, and everybody knows that too. That's like, been a big thing. Okay, so I've seen it scattered in the comments amongst the years, like, oh, so and so is tipping his pitches. But I feel like for some reason, opening day, everyone was like, Dan's tipping pitches, Dan's tipping pitches. I'm like, guys, we been, know <laughs> he's been tipping pitches for six years. Yeah. Like, it's hard not to in wiffle ball. Guys throw from different arm slots, different grips. Hard to hide a grip with no glove. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've obviously we know what Daniel's throwing. It's still hard to hit for the most part. And most guys in the league do tip pitches. It's just the reality of wiffle ball. And that's why um, I think Norp is so effective. And Cratch really um, gained some expertise in this last year. But um, if you release the, the ball from the same exact spot, but you can have two or three pitches stem from that, that's when you become really deadly and you become Cy Young caliber. Mm-hmm. Baranowski also had that last year with his drop in mm-hmm. a slider from a very, very high arm angle. Um that that's what really takes you to the next level as a pitcher mm-hmm. in wiffle ball. So do you think you guys did your homework more, but did you see very similar action from Baron in terms of his movement and control, or was he not at his best? Do you think? I think so. I think I think Baron could have maybe thrown a little faster. I think he was sitting like a lot at like 68, 69, 70. Mm-hmm. He wasn't really touching 70, 71, 72. And I think that mm. three miles per hour like really played in our favor. I know Definitely it's a very a minimal difference. like margin, but I think uh I I, I just 
I saw it really well. Sailor did. Um, even though Sailor was actually the one guy on our team that didn't have a homer, but mm -hmm. just Crazy. like speak, speaking with everybody on our team, like everybody just saw the ball very well. So hopefully that continues. Yeah, Sailor did hit a couple balls hard though. He got that RBI in the first game, I think, in the first inning to pair with your right uh, home run, and he'll, he'll be there. Sailor's I mean, hard consistent. Oh yeah, he, I don't want. I hate when people are yeah. overreacting like Sailor not getting a home know, run like so one funny. series. Oh, but that's like that's the funny thing is it's like expected. It's like it's you I watch know. a Wildcat series and you're expecting him to hit two home runs, right? But that's one thing I think as a positive that you can take away being the Wildcats or a Wildcats fan is you guys were able to get a two one series win on the Cobras, you know, mm -hmm. in the division, and you didn't have Nick Saylor really do, didn't produce much at all, yeah, which, I was, which is huge. I was super happy happy for Ty because, yeah. you know, obviously, last year we didn't have the four-man minimum, so, like, he was kind of the fourth guy for sure, like, outside of me, Saylor Pearson, but now, like, with the with the new rule in place, it's either going to be him or Liam every single time in that fourth slot, so for him to come up big in that game three, to have a home run, um, start the season off good against one of his good buddies, uh, Baranowski, who he mm -hmm. plays with or against in the Kalamazoo League. So mm -hmm. um, I talked to him before that series saying like, because uh, I thought Liam was going to come too. And then Liam called off for like some for work, like pretty late notice. So before the series anyways, though, I was like um, to Ty trying to get like insights on Baron because he sees him a lot and stuff like that. So he said he was pretty comfortable just on, on what he has. So I was it, it was, it was and cool he was to see pretty it helpful come, for the rest of you guys, too. Yeah, it was, it was cool to see uh, it come full, full circle and him uh, hit a home run. Yeah, I didn't want to jump ahead to Game 3 already, but I mentioned that right away. Just with the four-man rosters and how much depth teams are going to require to win games, especially late in the season, I, I thought it was cool how the back-to-back -back home runs came from the three, four spots in the lineup and not from you and Nick. I know, that's what I was, like, most happy about is because, like, I guess, like, that's kind of been the knock on us. Like, everybody's always like, well... If, if like Kyle and Sailor, if they're on, like you're still going to need production out of three and now four. Mm -hmm. So for them to kind of like put that to rest, at least for this first series, like I was super happy for them. Yeah. Consistency is going to be key throughout the year. I think I like the four. The, I like the rule change so far in the first two oh, series. So watching good. it. What I think is cool is it's like that rule might not necessarily. A team won't necessarily lose because of that rule, but they could mm -hmm. win because of it. If that makes sense. Like, their best guys aren't getting as many looks, but yeah. to have like a fourth guy step up in a big moment is, I don't know. I just, I think the rules. I oh, think it's trust me. Rule. Trust me, Jack. When I uh, first wanted to make that official, I wrote out an entire list of the pros and cons. That's what's, that's going to come out of this rule change. Mm -hmm. And of course the number one con was that you're going to receive less at bats for your top players and less right. big moments for like a guy, like whoever, whoever the leadoff hitter is for each team. But the biggest pro is that you're creating new moments for new guys and big spots. You're giving guys bigger roles um, and creating it more of like a, a, a team aspect as opposed to just the top three on each team. Mm -hmm. Like you're really getting more people involved. Um, I, I just think it's a great rule. And and also a, a kind of like a tiny thing, but there's no more ghost runners. So it's less confusing yeah. for, I guess, a casual yeah, we viewer. About that, yeah. um, just people, you know, not, there, there's less people being confused on just like base running situations. So. I yeah. think that's huge. I've been confused out there while I've been <laughs> playing before with the Ghost Runners. Jack had some confusion managing his lineup today, too. We were texting before the game. He's like, all right, how does this work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll talk DH, about that next we week. Will. That was actually pretty fun. There was confusion from Mark as well today. Yeah, I don't know. See, I, was I wasn't the only that. one asking. What was going on? We'll, 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 we'll talk about it yeah, on the it, next one. It wasn't an issue. But well, Let's move on to game two. So, yeah. Cats take game one. Big first inning. Kyle, you pitched great, by the way. Kind of brushed over that, I, I guess. I appreciate it. Yeah. You're, you're pounding the strikes. I mean, doing what he does I, best. I wanted to ask this question, actually, because um, we were talking about watching film and you naturally editing these videos. I, he I'm, watches the first most of all, film. I'm a big <laughs> proponent of like watching film. It always helped me to yes. prepare in sports, like football, lacrosse, watching film. You're on huddle before the games. Yeah. I mean, be, it just helps you be more confident. And like when, when you see something that you've seen on film out there in the game, it just gives you that extra like edge. So preparation is definitely key. But um, yeah, you've watched the most film out of anyone by hundreds of hours. You know what <laughs> I mean? It's not even close. That has to give you some some advantage. Like you probably don't practice wiffle ball that much anymore. You know, you've been right. playing so long and you've seen so many pitches. Right now, um, I think a big thing for me coming into the series was so obviously guys like Drew and Sean. They've seen so much of me. So so I know I can throw strikes, but really for me coming into the series, it was placement. It was really painting corners and actually being smart about where I want this ball to end up. So I felt like in the past, especially the Pred series last year, and um, I think the Cobras even touched me up a little bit, but I was just I was just literally just like 
trying to throw strikes and that was it and mm-hmm. like i wasn't trying to pinpoint corners like i was this time and i got my screwball involved a lot more this series and yeah it's something i felt like i i strayed away from last year like i feel like it is i guess like my signature pitch or whatever and i didn't throw it as much last year only if it was like two two strike situations but i was like throwing that a ton to sean just jamming him as you know being him being a lefty mm-hmm. and just um you know ha- making it hard on him um and and my drop ball was on i even incorporated a slider so mm-hmm. Yeah, when you when you face guys for so long, you know this. Like you just have to adapt, and you just have to be really have that pinpoint accuracy on the mound for for situations like that. Yeah, yeah. accuracy is really important. That's why I think that's why I think Jordan and Caden can get away with being not big movement guys, is because number one, guys haven't seen them a lot. Number two, is they both keep the ball down. They do a great job of keeping the ball in the lower half of the zone, which is mm-hmm. tough as a hitter trying to elevate the ball and hit a home run. So yeah, I think that plays a factor in their locations success. key. I feel like you've always had the location and ever since I've been in the league and Mm -hmm. that it's funny that you said that you try to mix in that rising screw ball Mm -hmm. a little bit more because that's the, that's the signature Kyle Schultz pitch. I I think in Mm -hmm. my mind, when I think of like facing you is like trying to, because not a lot of guys do that in the league really. Also something I think I struggled with last year too, especially was I threw too many strikes. If that makes any sense. Like, I think it's, uh, it's no, no it he, hear me out, hear me out. It's super effective when you can start, say, a riser right down the middle and then it rises right out of the zone and inside in the hands. That's a perfect pitch. Mm-hmm. Now, it's a ball, like if you would have t- taken it, but that's a super effective way to get ahead of a hitter or put them away. So um, I think I was literally just trying to just sit everybody down, dip everybody down on three strikes last year and just make making sure I'm hitting that 10 no matter what. But throwing balls can be effective if yeah. they start out right down the middle and then they just break away at the last second. And I think that's something I... I um, not perfected, but did a little bit better job this time of just jamming yeah. it on the hands with the riser, or throwing um, drop balls that dart dart away. Uh, yeah, um, on on righties also. I, I mean, it was just a <laughs> it was a funny sentence. Like I throw too many strikes, but I know what you're saying because now in MLW, it's like if you're gonna consist, even if the ball moves a ton, like if you have a super nasty slider, but you're constantly putting it into the zone, eventually mm-hmm. the guys are gonna be able to track it. Exactly. Like if it's in the same spot the hitters in the league now are so good that they're going to be able to hit it. Yeah. So I, I get what you're saying where now it's like being able, being able to get them to chase and being able to get them to swing at something that they, you know, can't exactly. hit or if they connect with it, it's probably going to be an out. Exactly. So, yep. Yeah. I want to rerun really quick too to the, the film watching Jack about how Kyle's seen hundreds of hours of film. Oh yeah. I don't know if this applies to editing as much, but in terms of me commentating, like after the series was over, guys like Davenport and Caden were texting me like, "Oh, like how did Kyle look? How did Jackson look?" And I'm like, "I don't even remember." Like He's I was so focused on the calling the game. Thing. Well, yeah, because you are. Yeah. You're not looking for like scouting. You're I'm focused no. on the task at hand, so no. it doesn't really benefit me that much being back there. How in did that you feel? Regard. How did you feel commentating? Um, I was happy. You didn't commentate the first series, right? No, I was no, no, yeah. on the field yeah. hitting, yeah. hitting bombs. Yeah. Oh, boy. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I felt <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> this is a weird thing to say, but. I was happy with my tone, which is weird. Mm-hmm. But so, but way back in Not the day, very many 20, voice 2018, 19, even 2020 a little bit, I used to think my voice sounded like too low and nasally. And then in 2021, I was like compensating for that. And like, I did like purposely pitch myself up a little bit. I feel like I sounded money the whole year. And then right out of the gate last year in 2022, once again, I was trying to overcompensate and like get to that higher tone. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I was too high on some of those opening day calls that I made when it was Wildcats versus D-backs 2022, 2022. Why do I struggle with that? I, that, I don't know. That's your I word. I have so many bloopers from saying 2022, yeah. but I felt like I was too, like I sounded way too high pitched. Yeah. I was, so I was happy with the, the little pocket my voice fell in. There was a couple calls that weren't perfect. Kyle did a good job of masking a couple in the edit, but for the most part, I was pretty happy. I don't know. You had a really good call after I believe it was Ty's home run. So right before I played the replays of Ty's, you were like, back to back from the three and four slots in the lineup or mm-hmm. something and then they, he hits the home run on the replays but i don't know what you said there but yeah it was it was really good like uh just way to kind of capitalize that third inning i still got a mix I, I did a pretty good job i thought i, I, I was not displeased too much yeah. getting it back because once again sometimes i think i do a good job and then i hear it and i'm like oh i don't like how my voice sounded that day but i feel like my i was in a nice pocket i've always wanted to try the commentating but i feel like i don't know enough about baseball that i would end up just saying the same like because you don't want to just say the same thing over and over again. You yeah, got to have no. a couple different calls for the same type of play because a lot of similar things well, that's happen. That's especially hard for us because at least baseball, it's like a live broadcast. So, say you're watching the Detroit Tigers play the Cleveland Guardians. 
even if a guy is repetitive on a strike three call, you're seeing pitches in between that. Whereas if right. it's us, with it's strike three, strike three, strike three, it's then it's just back to back to back. So exactly. you're red handed if you have a repetitive call. True. I do try That's to switch point. it up a little bit, but it also is hard. Like I don't usually like script my strikeout calls too much, but I'll try to like say like, okay, last pitch, last guy did say this. Let's try to avoid that. Do you do you guys ever script like a like a home run call or I think anything you said you, at you all? You premeditate, don't you? Sometimes, like you said for Warda's like walk off in twenty nineteen, you like had that whole oh, thing I have, ready. Sometimes if a situation's like so good, and I think of like a line on the spot, like I'll have that ready. But I mean, that's like some that's like the occasional. Like mm-hmm. some, usually I'll just not go all my, the time. Usually I'll, I'll go. I'll be honest. I do. I have one phrase in my head that I do want to say at some point this year, but it has a certain situation. You're waiting. Yeah. You're waiting like the, okay, right for example, I love the, that. the Vermont one when Shima hit the home run at the mm-hmm. Field of Dreams, and I was like, "Is this heaven? No, it's Vermont." Like, <laughs> like that was for sure scripted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That one makes sense. Sometimes you got to premeditate. I think, it, I think yeah. it's going to be. Prepared. I mean, it makes for a good I mean, moment. I think you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't. Try but sometimes to do that. you just like things happen where it's like you're calling a game. You can't yeah. script everything. You know no. what I mean? But yeah, a certain home run, like Kyle said, at a special venue. I remember in Oklahoma, I had asked Lee Lawson, like the director at the time, in the first year we were there, because I was calling it and it was Wildcats versus Eagles. Mm. I was like, because they had, instead of the sit go sign at, little, at Fenway there, they had the Love's trucking sign, like the truck stop sign. So I asked him like about details about that in case a ball hit that. Yeah. I asked him how high the monster was because when. Sailor cleared it. I'm like, that wall stands 16 feet, whatever inches. Like, I, because I asked yeah, him. So right. I knew what the call was going to be right. beforehand. So, yes, I guess there's a preparation there. Have to, man. Yeah. I mean, that's, you, you're obviously reacting to what is happening there, which makes it so hard. But if you're not prepared for that, you're just going to end up yeah. stumbling on your words or you're going to say the same thing over and over again or you're not going to have anything to say at all. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? In the moment. So, yeah. got to be prepared. I remember for that. we were at Mallard's practice a couple weeks ago and I think Davenport was pitching and I was kind of standing. I think maybe, K- maybe Caden was hitting. Well, no, not intentionally, but yeah. So I was He's standing. practicing his Carlington him. bombs <laughs> one. <laughs> Just rep- I was repeating his home run call. I was standing yeah. behind, you know, the strike zone watching them pitch and hit. And yeah, Davenport like hit, hit a corner or whatever. I was like, oh, dude, nasty. And the way I said it, Matt was like, that was your YouTube voice. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, <laughs> he's like, he's like that sounded like I was listening to a video. And I was like, oh, and I started to laugh. Your so YouTube voice. That's hilarious. <laughs> it wasn't intentional, but it is just my normal voice. I think it'd be funny for people to realize how much I like will repeat calls or give alternative calls to things. Like sometimes I'll literally say, so for example, like uh, after game one ends and I have like a concluding line right before the box scores show up, like I'll say that line probably like five different ways and in the edit, I'll like put together right. whatever I think is best. You can also plug in stats. Like if we hear from your dad, like, oh, so-and-so went six for six this game. Like you can plug yeah, it yeah, in. Yeah. That's also a good yeah. thing to do. Mark Schultz, always there, handy with the stats. It's it, an, an important it. role because sometimes you don't realize really like, this guy's walked eight times in a row. You don't realize that when you're caught up in the moment. No, yeah. So to hear that in your ear while you're behind the camera, like, oh, okay, I'll know Always that. been a crucial part to the MLW production. Facts. Definitely. Facts. Always <laughs> worth a shout out. <laughs> always worth a shout always out. Always worth a sure. shout out. But all right, finally, bringing it back. Game two. Mm-hmm. What'd you see from Sawyer at the dish? At the dish. A lot of drop oh, balls. honestly, I was I was pissed because I was seeing him super well and I didn't have the hits that reflected that mm-hmm. as I did with Baron, who I honestly saw Sawyer better, but um a, a very winnable game just overall. And but the thing is you gotta gotta have the pitching to complement the hitting. And um as, as good as Pearson was in the first two innings, it got away from him in the third. Um, he even said the ball was kind of, you know, not great coming into the inning. And I said, we'll, we'll stick with you and we'll go from there and proceeded to walk three guys. And then of course we went to sailor who, you know, obviously has had a tremendous ERA in the past couple of years, gets the ball over the plate and he had some, some speed issues. Um, <laughs> I hate to put sailor on blast here, but there was about 10 pitches. I'm not even kidding over mm-hmm. the speed limit. So he had to have really? some, hmm. he had to have a little bit of, um, you know, getting back into the swing of things type of moment in the, uh, in that third inning. But I will say, like after those runs did come across, he he sat down three guys in a row. There was like a he did. There, I think it was three strikeouts. Maybe maybe there was a ground out in there, but he um he got out of there. There was no mercy in that inning or anything like that. Or I guess it was the third, so it, there wouldn't have been anyways. But, but it was only five. But only only five, so that was good to see. But um Jackson and Nick, they will definitely be used heavily throughout the um the course of the season. So happy they got the reps and uh, hopefully they um, learn from their those are uh, valuable pitching. reps. You got to get yeah. those, they those were, rough days sometimes. Does, yeah. Does that series in your mind as a manager dictate one way or the other which direction you'll probably lean more towards so, in regards to those two's playing yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think a wildcat philosophy for us this year is that it's gonna be entirely series based. So basing on previous history of of 
like say uh, like Sailor pitch really good against the Mallards in the past, like we'll probably go Sailor there. Or Easy. if it's a team like the Preds or Cobras, like we thought this year, like Mash. a guy like Pearson where the Cobras hadn't seen him, like we thought that'd be pretty effective. And for two innings, it really was. So right. um, I think we're going to go on the philosophy of it's going to be very series-based. Was Sailor a guy that hung around? Here's a guy. The, he, he talk about a guy. <laughs> Here's a guy. Uh, was Sailor a guy that would hang, would kind of flirt with the um, speed last year a lot? I, I feel like Honestly, I don't Sailor, really remember him doing that. No, really Sailor's slow. been good. Like, I think he just seems sort of uncharacteristic. He's been playing so much baseball lately. I think he just got uh, done with the season or something. I think he's still in baseball mode. Yeah. Um, so just I just, he, throw and gas. It was really, it was like 74 every single time. Like uh, he, he just needs to take it down like one notch. I'm not even kidding. Like literally, literally like one, one or two notches. Well, I think too, yeah. last year he pretty much just sat with like that, sl- somehow it worked, but that slow, like rising slider. Mm-hmm. Yes. No one could touch that. This, because he got hit a little bit in that playoff series, he's developed a screwball in the offseason, and the movement was good. Mm-hmm. But I don't think he's comfortable yet yeah, finding that pocket for speed. And like Kyle yeah. said, fresh off the baseball season where he's a pitcher, I think his arm, his body is just in full in full go mode. He needs to tune it back just a little bit, which takes time. So yeah. um, p- part of the reason that spring training benefits some players is Nick didn't make it to that. So I don't think you, uh, I don't think you, nec- I don't think you have anything to worry about in terms of Pearson and Sailor pitching. Obviously, he didn't get that win game two, but... Mm-hmm. Um, I think you guys will be fine. That being said, we talked to Dan last week and he was kind of giving us some insight as to his strategy with the the games, you know, him going game two and Dallas going game one and three. I feel like he's probably going to stick with that strategy throughout the season because he was talking about, Mm -hmm. you know, how his stuff works better with like a beat up ball or or, or Dallas Mm kind of relies on the better ball a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Do you think you see yourself kind of having a similar strategy where you're always going one and three or do you think it's kind of series by series yeah I'll, to this i'll say i think this works either way uh, we've seen with robles he likes to do the one and two thing um but we've also seen in the past it, it's very successful when your ace goes one and three with obviously the new wiffle balls that's something that i probably prefer so that's something i think we'll probably stick with yeah. um for for the near future but you know, you know obviously if if things go the other way, then I might go one and two or something like that, or we'll see how our alternative pitching goes with with Pearson and Nick. But regardless, though, of what the other teams do, um, I think I'll be going one and three. Yeah, makes I think, sense. I think, yeah, it's a case by case basis. I know when I used to pitch, like I used to do one and three too, and I always found it hard to kind of like like you get loose, you pitch a game, then you don't throw for an hour. Mm-hmm. Getting back into it can be kind of tough. I know Jordan always like, yeah, I want to keep going, I want to keep going. Of course, at some point I might have to say like, yo, let's let's make a switch yeah. if we have to. Got to be that guy sometimes, but. So far, we haven't had to do that, so we'll see. And, and the reason we've we've been so um, kind of attached to that philosophy in the past is because my pitching style was so different than Nick's, so that when I would be done with it my game... It does help. For, like, it's actually yeah. better to change the looks. Yeah, you, you, when we go to Sailor, and then it did, it have an entirely different like arm slot and type of pitches and uh, release point and that kind of thing. And then, you know, you come back to game three where, you know, I, I get rested and I'm, I'm back to my, you know, different arm slots and different pitches and... Right. I, I think it's an effective strategy. I think the the psycho there's also like psychology behind it that makes sense to me. Where if you start your you know you start your ace in in the first game, let's say you win that. If you throw them in the next game and they've already seen him for a game, so the odds of them getting around to him is higher. That's what yeah. I So if like, you lose yeah. that game, right. now you have your pitcher who you feel you know didn't give you as good a chance to win as yeah. your number one yeah. playing in the third game to try to win the series that you started up one Oh as. So yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. the psychology of losing that series when you yeah. start with an advantage. Whereas like you win the first game. Now you're kind of not playing with house money, but like you're ahead in the series. Yeah. And if you get a win in that second game with your number two, now you're going back to your top guy yeah. in the third game. So it's, there's also like some psychology behind it, I think. Yep. Per- personally, too, I love having the rest and playing the field. I love playing the field and left field. Yeah, you've, so, been, um, you've been making Cats some plays defense. out there. We didn't there. talk about that Thank yet you. at all. Yeah, Cats defense was sick. I appreciate it. But I yeah. really love finishing off that first game, you know, ideally in a win, and then taking a deep breath and just not having to worry about, you know, focusing on pinpointing mm-hmm. precision and, on, and that stuff on the mound and just really just playing left field and having fun and, you know, treating it like the old Colts field days where I'm just – trying to make any top play and just trying to have fun out there with the uh, Pearson and Wright and, you know, have somebody else dialing in on the mound. I have a lot of fun playing left field for sure. I think that, um, like you mentioned about the teams being more deep and having 
some guys who normally would just pitch also play in the field yeah is is making the defense all around better because those pitchers are just like myself for example you know i said on the podcast uh a while ago that i you know was ashamed of my efforts in the field and that i pro- i can't throw a wiffle ball so me what trying you, to throw like often? first base or Uh-oh. you know just doing anything really in the field like having someone who can actually throw a wiffle ball yeah you know what i mean I, defensively makes a huge difference. I so think, those pitchers just raise the level of yeah, defense. The Meadows is so quirky too, where it's like you really can only become better at wiffle ball fielding at the Meadows by by reps and experience. Right. Like you can play in these pro pro leagues, you can play in a baseball league, but like our style of play is so interesting and precision based and um like flip based where it's like you you really have to be, you know, <laughs> instant mm-hmm. on those on those flips a second or when you're throwing the first, like you gotta get it out quick. Like ex- extremely quick when you have a guy, a guy like uh, Drew or Sawyer or Jimmy Norp just you know running super hard down that line. So you got to be you know very pre- precise. You guys like that play in the first game, first series where Jordan fielded it, and I just got out of the way. Yeah, <laughs> dude, that was good. Like Kyle said, those flips happen so fast. It's like let's just eliminate the variable of a throw. Why not? Just take it. Yourself, Why not? Bro. Yeah, it makes it, it caught it, him off guard a little. It makes bit. the I communication easy. I had to talk like, to him oh, afterwards. I have no like, choice. I was like, yeah, if you can, I've already said this to him, but I was like, if you can ever take it yourself, I was like, just start sprinting over there because yeah. like, eliminating the throw. Is yeah. just one less thing to worry about. Just take it yourself. There, shout, shout out to Dan too. We've been incorporating the Eagle Shift the into Eagle our defensive shift. lineups. It's a what shame is the Eagle the, Shift? It's, it's, a shame oh, they got, the Eagle it's a shame shift. they got that coin for them. I guess it they is. Started, an, I don't know the a, Eagle Shift. It's a groundbreaking shift that Daniel mm-hmm. Schultz implemented with Neil Smith circa 2019. It's basically where you 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 pretty much give up right field and and playing in that gap, and you just put like a guy. It, it was Neil. You just put him on first base, so that if there's a hard comeback or back to Dan. You don't have to worry about pegging him or chasing him down or touching first himself. You literally just flip it over to first. And a guy, it was Neil. He didn't. He doesn't have to sprint over. Yeah, to, that's the sketchy part. To to get first base and like multitask uh, with touching the base and then also trying to catch the ball. A lot of times with one hand, it's like he's already sitting on the first on first base. All you got to do is catch it. The first series. I see. Yeah, so in baseball, Jack, like you have plenty of time to get over there, get both feet set, and then like yeah. step as the throw is coming in. Yeah. In wiffle ball, it's like it's like I'm like reaching for the base with my right foot and then trying mm-hmm. to make it's like a mess. So yeah, so I, I call I call Daniel the Joe Madden of this league. Joe Madden, of course, with the Rays back then, he was kind of the first guy to implement yeah. the shift. So, um, so, so with, you're basically with, giving up with nobody the, outside. I put Pearson on first. You're basically much. giving up the the coverage and off chance someone hits it to right field That's for correct, the yeah. advantage of hey, if it, it's hit on the ground, I'm already on the back. Which a lot, which a lot of times too, an out's a lot. Higher. Yeah, which a lot of times too, that would have been a single anyways. Like right. as long as as long as Pearson can just get there and track it and limit the double, like yeah, like yeah. our job is done. Like the Eagles, Damn, shift. I like it. It has been around for a long time. There was great defense from both teams played. Uh, Same as Baron last year. had. A, Baron that, had yeah. a couple. Baron is such Baron a good. Is a real, so you had the call in the game Baron's that he is a really good goal, defensive If we had a pitcher, gold glove for each position in the field, Baron would be on the mound. It'd be like. Kyle or Shima and left, and then in right, I don't know who, Dude. maybe even Jonah. The D backs defense is so I mean, Baron's, let's not forget about Norp's uh, yeah. kicks to home okay. plate. Too. I mean, he goes great. without saying. Yeah. Baron's not even sneaky uh, athletic at this point. He's just flat out athletic, and he's yeah. smart with the ball. He's clean with the ball. Like, he's always giving good flips to first base. Like, he's stopping everything on the mound. So, shout out to Baron. He knocks it yep. down, gets it done. Yep. He's a gritty player. I like the way Baron plays. Me too. He's, he's really real, coming to his real, own. Real level-headed guy. Doesn't I know, let he, things bother him. I think he just brings the job the, done. I he's think the one he, guy that doesn't fit the Cobra. Mold. I was gonna say, <laughs> but I think that helps them out because if if they had another, like they're almost two up at some points, you know, like if they had <laughs> yeah. another guy that was, he, oh, yeah. he evens them out. Yeah, yeah. that is that is a good point. Yeah, for it's, sure, it's needed. Yeah, I, I, there was a comment. Of course, of course, I didn't know this would be edited that way, but it was funny how Kyle did it, where it was like. Tommy talking about the Cobra's maturity while Drew's on second base barking like a dog on all fours. But yeah, I was cracking up there. That I do think part. I just had to do that. Yeah, the Cobras that were being, great. they were being immature during warmups. They were doing push ups and God knows what else. But from 2021 to last year, I'm not going to attempt to say the 22 word anymore, but um, they have matured in my opinion. Yeah, they have. They still have their moments, but I think overall the presence of Baron helps that group. Big yeah. Time. Do you think I'd like to obviously, Ask Drew a little bit, but do you think that Sawyer has any chance to kind of move into their number one spot, or is Baron Baron sort of that guy? Honestly, Baron's Baron. He's going to have ace caliber stuff every single time. So I don't know if you want to slot Sawyer into that role right now. Um, I think a lot of it too is any given series. Some guys are going to be on, some guys aren't. But throughout the course of the past couple of years, I mean, Baron's proved to you know be a, a an ace caliber player in this league. So he's got four or five pitches. 
all can be strikes. And, um, you know, Sawyer's obviously a very good pitcher too. So um, I don't know about deeming, you know, one guy, you know, their absolute number one and having another guy be the number two because we've seen guys be better than the others on any given day, especially last year. So that, mm-hmm. what I can say is that they have a dynamic pitching staff. Yeah, yeah. Just, just candidly speaking, I don't think Sawyer has, like, his arsenal is not consistent enough yet or deep enough yet. He has the big, drastic, wicked drop ball, which is nice, but similar to what happened at the end of my career, like, that's his most accurate pitch, which should not be the case. Which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. So he needs to develop, like, a trusty riser or, like, more, less drastic drop ball, something that he can kind of pound in for a strike when he needs a strike. Which he is like doing, crazy. by the way. He's, he's working on it, but it's still, it's still a bit of an issue. I think Sawyer's pretty, pretty dang good. I think, yeah, I think, um, you know, you just have to continue to adapt, though, because as... You know, something I've had to obviously experience is like when you have so much film on you, people know what's coming. And then from there, you have to really diversify. So um, that's just a, a good thing for all the young guys in the in the league to know is just like people are probably going to get on to you at some point. So when that happens, try to be one step above and, and counter with something else. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For sure. But overall, Sawyer pitched fine. I was being, I guess, a little harsh on him. But just <laughs> from an outside perspective, I do think that he needs more reliable stuff for tricky counts. That's fair. That's fair. For tricky counts. I mean, I think he'd probably say the same thing. Yeah, I think so. What yeah. do you think about the Cobra's number three spot, though? They have I mean, Chris, they got Chris. They got Drew. It's not really much pitching. of a question. It's Gus, isn't it? Gus was well, the all fun yeah. game MVP. I mean, isn't it Gus? I mean, he's the only guy in the team that has an all fun game MVP. <laughs> is this yeah. for pitching number three? Yeah. I'd say it's Chris. Isn't he the only guy in the Chris, league who has one of those? Chris, <laughs> I'd, say yes. it's, I'd say it's Chris or Gus. That's like our version of the Nickelodeon MVP. Whatever that <laughs> the slot. Ma- yeah. NFL game. The MVP. I'm pretty sure like Mitch Trubisky has the like MVP. the MVP. <laughs> That's so funny. It's yeah. literally our version of it. No, I we got to have a slime I, game. I, I think which, which game would be the, which it series been the, would be the fun, slime series? Oh, we dropped the ball with that. We should have had slime no, this year. No, a real, a real... A real series, you have to pick one. Wait, what which, are you talking about? Like a real MLW series to be the Nickelodeon broadcast to be the slime one. Oh, that'd be one. so fun! Yeah, which one would it be though? If there's this a Nickelodeon year, producer which out matchup there, would it be? Cody Studio. Uh, um, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I think Preds Cobras would be fun because it's a bunch of just like slime balls. No, I, I, no, <laughs> I, I, I said this to you earlier. I think. I think the two fan bases that are the youngest, I think, is the Preds and Cobras because they mm. like just like the flair and flash that they play with. So yeah. that that'd be my answer. That'd be that. a good slime one. Yeah, it'd be the slime game. I feel like I feel like the D backs gotta get slimed up. Yeah. They deserve some slime. D backs versus Magic. <laughs> Nickelodeon. <laughs> that is a slime fest. <laughs> <The> Nickelodeon Studios. <laughs> At the Nick Studios. Now Nickelodeon can come out to the meadows, honestly. It wouldn't be right without that, I don't think. Is Nickelodeon dying or are they still like going strong? I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of about still doing slime. Four years old. I don't watch Nickelodeon. Like, is, do they still hold? The, the, yeah, there's like still like a kids' choice sure. toys, right? I'm not positive, but I do like SpongeBob still. But I haven't watched SpongeBob in a long time. Kids, let me know what the I scene don't watch is TV. like. I got a nice 60 inch TV upstairs. It's literally a decoration. It never gets turned down. Hold on, question: Were you guys it's an expensive piece I, of art? I know yeah, you were more know. Nickelodeon, but Jack, were you more of a Nickelodeon or a Disney Channel kind of kid? Or a Cartoon um, Network Greaseball? <laughs> uh, you know. I, <laughs> Uh, I was mostly like raking leaves and like <laughs> collecting rocks as a child. Oh. No, I I think uh, <laughs> I think I kind of just mix it up. I definitely watched you're Disney well, Channel. Well I feel was, like I watched uh, Disney Channel probably. What more. was like Sesame Street on that was like super family friendly? Like PBS, PBS, yeah, yeah, PBC, PBS, PBS, yeah, public public broadcast services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know some kids were like only allowed to watch that stuff, so I feel sorry for you if you weren't able to watch like SpongeBob. Yeah, that was my wife. She wasn't able to watch SpongeBob. What? Oh, I, yeah. I grew. I was a SpongeBob kid through and through. That was my show. That was my cartoon. I mean, that's a timeless show, right? SpongeBob, there. Fairly Odd Parents. I liked Jimmy Neutron. Was good. Um, we got Teen Nick too in my house, so I was yeah, always I watching. Like, nah, we didn't have the premium. Drake and Josh, the Ned's Declassified, Zoe One Hundred and One, Ned's Declassified. School survival. Shout out to them. I think they they were trying to get a reunion going, but they got denied. I just saw a TikTok about it. There was a lot of great shows I'm forgetting about, I'm sure, but I was not a Cartoon Network kid. Sorry for those of you who were. But, um, <laughs> After just giving you guys a straight. <laughs> the Disney, no, the, the, <laughs> but you call him the grease ball. <laughs> Come on. Um, uh, moving on from that. Disney Channel had the Disney Channel games, which was sweet. It was like the Olympics, but it was all Disney Channel actors and actresses. I mean, if you like didn't... Fourth of July, get a glow stick and like do the you're watching yeah, Disney exactly. Channel or a sparkler. sparkler I mean, sparkler. yeah, if you didn't do that, I glow mean, stick. Kind of, oh, kind of really didn't have a childhood, I have something I really want our audience to talk to me about. If you guys watched Nick Gas growing up, yeah. please DM me. 
because I'm talking Legends of the Hidden Temple, Figure It Out, like all these little like game. They were like game shows for for Nickelodeon, and it had its own channel. It's called Nickelodeon Gas. We watched those back. DM what, me if you guys watched that. Where we and we were watching that stuff. I don't know, but but yeah, that was my favorite one. It was Legends of the Hidden Temple. It was like obstacle course base. Guts was another was another Guts. one. We there'd be a bunch Sick of like show. different teams, and they'd have to do like relay <laughs> yeah, races and stuff. Craig. Was that what it was called? Something what? like that? The mountain. Yeah, yeah. yeah they I had to like Craig. literally climb a mountain in like a minute and try to like I don't know win some sort of vacation. Mm-hmm. So game three. So game three. Yep. <laughs> um. I mean, it wasn't much. It was just a shutout fest. Was, oh, oh, going to the top of the third, and then back to back bombs. Yep, Jackson yep. and Ty both were like shots too. Yeah, there were some comments uh, around Jackson's footwork in his in his swing. Yeah, which which we I think we talked about with him. Okay, before on the podcast about it, did we not? I don't know. I think we did. I, know, I thought we had him on. Man. Either way, he hit a home run. That's all I care. Either about. way. It's it's very interesting to watch. It doesn't need like, to look good, like we said last it week. It doesn't. My swing. It doesn't. But I don't know. The footwork's crazy, and the kid hits nukes. Yeah. No. I, I regardless of how he gets the job done, I was just happy that he has, and that you for know, sure he was an all star like a couple years ago. Like he's been coming through in the big moments. You know, past f- three years now, he's been you know it's his third year in the league. So he's only going to get better. And um, speaking on Ty Smith too, like. He was obviously struggling a lot, but he learned from his mistakes because he was getting that drop mm-hmm. ball from Barron like pretty much every single time. So I was just like swing a little lower and like he knew this, he knew to, to, to do the same thing. So he got that drop ball once more and he obviously yeah. sent it over to right field. And that was a bomb, too. I feel like uh, if you're a Cobras fan, you got to be happy that Sean Flynn got involved in that game because I feel like last yeah, year. Yeah, bomb. I forgot about that. Yeah. I feel one like, strike away from shutting him out or whatever. Yeah. I think it's a bomb. Well, I feel like last year the the bats for the Cobras kind of ended up being their Achilles heel. And I think what, you know, Drew did so well at the plate last year, which was a good thing because, you know, he wasn't really focused on pitching, so he could kind of just dial in his bat a little bit more. But I feel like he kind of was, they kind of, you know, lived and died by how Drew played mm-hmm. and if he was able to to bring the runs in. So getting some early production from Flynn is huge. Mm-hmm. Guy that's been around a long time. If he can, you know, put together a really good year and support for them. Right. That, I think that'd be huge for the Cobras. I think also another X factor for them too is Baron at the plate. Yeah. And he, it, he looked good. Uh, at the plate. Yeah. At, on the, in the video, you probably won't see it, but he had a couple, couple like hits that were just a little bit left of third base, you know, obviously foul balls, but he was putting the bat on ball and he was, I felt like seeing me kind of well near the end of game three. So I think the future is still bright for him at the plate. Yeah. He could be good. I was, Maybe not disappointed, but I was. Uh, I still am hoping for a better season from Sawyer at the plate. He was a little quiet, didn't leave the yard at all. A couple base hits, but I do think he has a ton of potential in this league. He's a little bit aggressive, like he will swing at pitches out of the zone. But I've just seen him play at tournaments. He's just a lot of fire in his belly when he plays. He's a great mm-hmm. tournament and player. He just he does make contact with pitches with a lot of movement, no matter how fast they are. He's a great contact hitter. Mm-hmm. Loves wiffle ball, like Kyle says a lot. So I think he's a guy that would uh, really elevate the Cobras. You know numbers at the plate if he can get it going at a, at a better level. I think he's I think he's got some pop in his bat, and I think the aggressiveness. You'd like to think that he would learn a little bit as he's swinging at pitches that aren't hitting the zone as much, and maybe dial it back a little bit. But I think being I don't think there's really anything wrong with being super aggressive and swinging at stuff like you think you can hit because I feel like the pitchers are so good now where if you're just up there watching anyway and you know not really attacking the ball but you're sitting back and trying to react you're just you're going to get diced up like yeah. you're just going to get caught looking yeah. a lot. It's a fine fine line. It's a fine line a, but I mean I'd rather you I'd can rather take four close pitches in a row and look like a genius with a four pitch walk or you can like take three strikes in a row and you're like what is Or it you doing? can swing on the first pitch yeah. and hit a bomb. Or you can just hit a bomb. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to mention too, I know I know Drew's a pretty smart manager and I don't know if this was talked about too, but I'm pretty sure they know that like I do throw a lot of strikes. So I think that is a reason why they did want to be aggressive because like mm-hmm. I'm not a guy that they thought was going to probably walk in a bunch of runs. So therefore, right. like, if you're going to be getting a lot of strikes, like you're going to have to hit the ball and therefore be aggressive and, and try to like hit one out of the park or just get get, get the guys moving. So 100%. I'm not sure if that was said within their within their team, um, but that's kind of what it felt like. Is like they they were ready to come out, you know, swinging. So yeah. that's kind of what I felt on the mound. Yeah, yeah. Kyle's definitely a guy that you should be be ready to be aggressive on. Don't, yeah, don't go up there shopping, or you're gonna be he's gonna be around. Quickly. He's gonna be around or in yes, the zone. Yes, you can pretty sure. much count on that. I agree, 100. percent 
But overall, great series. I think Wildcats Cobras is kind of evolving into one of my favorite matchups, uh, like that I got to commentate at least from behind the main camera. Mm-hmm. Seems to be these last two years, like my one of my favorites, and um, hopefully there's more good ones this year too. But right away, I was like the, the defense. Yeah, the defensive plays make the video so much more exciting. Mm-hmm. Sailor, I don't, ha- I didn't have him pegged as a guy who's great at defense, but my gosh, he great looked plays. money out there on uh, multiple occasions. I think that's honestly one of the things that takes our league to the next level is like. You can have other leagues where you have insane pitchers and insane hitters and, you know, speed limits to where you hit a bunch of home runs. But something that you can't really fake is phenomenal defense. Like, that takes years of experience and athletic ability and just, like, instincts. Like, that's something that comes through, like, a long time of of playing wiffle ball, especially in our style. So, whether it's Sailor making, you know, diving plays and flips to second or Drew just making snags and left, like, Mm -hmm. it, it really is something that I think takes our league to the next level. I um are we gonna talk about how in that first game I think it was maybe game two game one or game two when Sailor made that incredible play off the bad hop yeah that's what I'm talking base, about mm-hmm. to Pearson what was Drew's plan there Drew came in like a bull just I, full I, head yeah. of steam like I, I, I figured it out what was he doing so originally I was thinking like wow that's an extremely dirty play by Drew but what I think what are he you was talking th- about the the he like it didn't ended in slide. inning he like was gonna come off the was he gonna <laughs> just like keep running is that what you think he's gonna yes. do yes so what I it, it, I think it makes him look really bad on camera, but it looks like he's about to just bulldoze Pearson over and just absolutely truck him. But I'm thinking that he thought there was going to be a bobble from from Sailor to Pearson in that exchange to where he would take third and maybe even like possibly home because he's an aggressive runner. Mm-hmm. He, he pretty much pulled an Alec Warda yeah. where he takes an extra base on the throw, but Pearson caught it and then Drew just like not sliding. He had nowhere to go and he just kind of went. Yeah, because like, oh, what, what yeah, it looked yeah. like is like, if okay, Drew's, if if Drew's he, listening to this, please yeah. confirm, but I believe that is what's happening. But when I watched it back for the first time, I was like, I was kind of mad. I honestly. saw it real time. Like, I was like, literally almost like killed my player there. Well, no, I just didn't know what his plan was because even if Pearson, even if, even if Drew beat the throw, like, was on the base before Pearson caught it, like, he would have been out regardless because he would have just ran past the base. Like, yeah. you got to either slide or break down. I think he would have just go past it. Yeah, I got to watch back <laughs> the film, but I think he, w- he would have adjusted and just made the turn to third. But he would have had to. He had nowhere else to go. I know, I got to. Ha- we'll, we'll, we'll have to just go straight from the source. I know. Yeah, maybe we'll straight have to hear to the from source. We need to hear from Drew on that. I think it's worth mentioning the um, jersey matchups. I guess. I will say, I will say, even after today's series with the Magic and the Gators, I got to give credit where credit's due. I think the Cobras have the best uniforms so far. They're so icy. They they're are. Sick. I told you guys. The hat and the and the. There's a reason the white, why I went into that garage so cool. and put on a red <laughs> hat. So and I did cool. the hat reveal on the podcast mm-hmm. before we had the full weekly videos because the Cobras <laughs> hat is so clean and it's just a simple jersey, which is the best kind of jersey. There's a reason we also took like three months to get everything coordinated mm-hmm. and perfected to the way we wanted it to. So everything syncs up with, you know, hat and jersey and then the, everything, all the colors match and the logos are, you know, high quality, like. Yeah, we uh, that probably took us like months on months to perfect. What did you say, Tom? Uh, I don't even remember. Things move slowly too, because you're working with a designer, like a freelance designer, and then a merchandise company, and then we also had a hat company. And you have all these things moving, um, and figuring out quantities for not only to outfit our league but produce in mass. So like, I'm super happy that it's coming into fruition, and like, it's looking so good in the videos now. I'm starting to smell this fire a little bit. Yeah, smell I'm starting. Gas. I'm starting to feel it. I've been feeling it bad. But, oh, you're um, smelling it? It's cool yeah. over here. God, I'm dying In the guest here. chair. Can we brand uh, this or something? Put, like, a sign. <laughs> like, the super cool guest chair. <laughs> yeah, we just need a light on you. That's what we need, mostly. Um, That'd be pretty cool. But, yeah, the, the Cobras look pretty sick. I can't lie. I got so to I gotta give it to Sawyer, too. Um, probably. Die, boy. I think, I think just, like, as of right now, like, the most photogenic guy. Like, there's always the best pictures of Sawyer from yeah, Baker. Yeah, the best action yeah, shots. He just, yeah, because he's so emotional out there. He shows so much emotion. So, like. He's got eye black, too. As a photographer. The eye black, yeah. As a photographer, you're looking for the guys that are, like, showing it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Really, their emotions on their sleeve and wearing it on their he's sleeve. He's got the flow so, going. Hey, hey yeah, emotional, the eye black, the emotional eye black accessories. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great photo. If yeah. you have the good lighting, that's that's the four elements, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if only he was a better looking guy, then that would be. <laughs> <laughs> but, no. Great job. Great pictures again from Baker. Yeah. He unfortunately is in Florida this week uh, shooting for the Wayne State men's and women's, ten- women's tennis teams. So Magic and Gators didn't have him today, but we'll get him out there shooting you guys at least once this year for both of your squads. So not to worry, fans. We'll get some great shots. Yeah, we did our best with the iPhones, but iPhones make do for stuff like this. But in that situation, no, yes, the, the $3,000 camera is better than the iPhone Tough to camera, beat. unfortunately. Tough to beat. Yeah, especially with the nice photographer, too. Mm-hmm. So. But overall, good series. This week's comment of the week, we got to give a shout out to Skinny Boy DJ, who said, I just came back to MLW for the first time since 2017. Good to see Kyle still playing. <laughs> Which <laughs> Where's I he found, been for the last six oh, years? Well, that's what's funny about it is because, so 2017, 
at that point, Kyle already been playing for eight years yeah. since 2010. You know what? Fast forward another six years, Kyle's still playing. I'm yeah. actually kind of weirdly flattered. Still raking. I'm I'm weirdly flattered because he remembered who I was from 2017. <laughs> like, he had to have seen. Come on, you got to see one video in the past six years. I he just, remember my name. I thought that one was so funny because it's like, where where have you been? <laughs> he just wasn't He's coming back. Him, I guess. I guess. Shot I him. wonder what made him want to come back. Skinny boy DJ, let me know. Pro- probably the YouTube algorithm. That could yeah. be it. Yeah, that's, that that's it. what it most, is. That's the most likely scenario. I don't think we can get analytics on a per account basis, but that's what I would, I would guess it is for this video in particular. But um, thank you guys for all the comments. Again, got a lot on this video as well. A lot of comments about um, the Cobras and their emotions, Pearson swing. Jerseys, a lot Pearson of comments pitched. on the jerseys. A lot of people hype about Pearson's, um, despite like his shaky finish there, people are pretty hype about his home run and his pitching. Yep. I think people are are high on him as a as a young and up and comer in this league. Even though this is his third season now. Yeah. So Pearson's yeah, he's he's slowly racking up. He's the years. on the rise. He's a he's a talented kid. He loves the game as well. And like honestly I keep saying that I keep harping on that. But if you love the game of whiff ball and you sacrifice a lot of your time to play in tournaments and just like, you know, go the extra mile to practice and stuff, like usually that translates to success in MLW. So I love to see that out of my, all my guys. Yeah, for sure. Definitely puts in the work. You can tell that much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any final comments from you, Jack? Um I'm just really sweaty. Yeah. I'm uh, <laughs> about to wrap this one up. Um, I wish we could keep going. I'm, I, I'm liking this. I want to keep talking. We've been going for so long. I'm really, this this shirt on the back of it, not a pretty sight. I don't it's know right what now. it is. I feel like the time just flies way faster being in person and talking I'm, with you guys. I'm not much virtual. of a night owl, so I do feel tired right now. It's been a long pod. But I'm saying we've already been talking for probably an hour. Yeah. And that hour feels a lot shorter than when we've been doing it virtually. Especially in person. Vir- virtually it can saying. drag on. In person virtually it's quicker. like, you know, we would we would always have to restart the Zoom at 45 minutes and be like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Like, that was only 45 minutes. But I know, this, I know. this hour flew by. Yeah, we appreciate your guys' support so far on the video episodes as well. We're going to keep rolling those out for you every single week. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Audio listeners, if you've not yet checked it out, please do. That's a wrap for this one, guys. Next week, we'll be breaking down the Gators versus the Magic series, so I'm sure Jack yep. will have a lot to say about that. But uh, for now, that's a wrap. Jordan Curdy wears a size 9 shoe, and we'll see you guys next week.